Susan, welcome to the podcast. It is so great to be here, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. It's a, it's an honor. I've been looking forward to this for a, an awful long time. And uh, I want to start here. We're both former lawyers, me uh, much less so than you. You worked at it for about seven years, I think. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you tell an amazing story. Was that in your first TED Talk about uh, your career path being changed tremendously? Or was it the more recent one? I forget. Uh, well, I, I I did talk about it in my more recent TED Talk, the one that's okay. about bittersweet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is incredible. So I, what I would love to know, though, um, is how do you or do you think your time in law, the whole rigmarole of law school, and then the seven years or so of actual practice, how do you think that gave you a skill set or even a worldview that is informing what you're doing today? Well, I, I was just laughing at you using the word rigmarole because it is, of course, the perfect <laughs> word. To- <laughs> It is a rigmarole. Yeah. I mean, I I think about this all the time because mm. I, I really was the least likely lawyer on earth. You know, it just was like not the right um, career path for me. So I often ask myself the question of like, well, if I had to do it all over again and could wave a magic wand, would I not have gone to law school and not gone down that path? And I don't actually f- say that. I'm, you know, I'm glad that I did. Um, I'm glad that I spent all those years. And part of it is because I I think my natural tendency is to live in the world of um, art and philosophy and things like that. And and, and, And so spending as many years as I did in the extremely hardcore world of corporate law um, gave me a real understanding of how that whole side of the world works. Um, You know, I was part of it for all those years. So many of the people who I'm writing my books to are part of that world. And I, I understand it now so viscerally. Um, And I think there's also something about, um, you know, just the way our culture talks about business, that if you're not part of it can make it seem very other and very, um, uh, I don't know. There's all kinds of value judgments that are attached to it. Whereas if you're part of the business world, as it, as when you're part of any world, you understand it's just people at the end of the day, you know? And, and so I, I'm just glad that I got to spend 10 years. Um, one, one of the things and mine, we were talking before we hit record, you know, mine was one year. You had a lot longer than that in there. And it was a student. I was a bottom of the totem pole. Like it doesn't get any lower than that. But it was funny because I knew I was heading into ministry, but I felt like I got a front row seat to that world in downtown Toronto. And what I realized was just that, that these titans, these icons are basically just people. And a lot of them were chronically unhappy, chronically unhappy with life, chronically. They, they made a boatload of money, but <clears throat> that didn't buy them a lot. And often when I write like you, I think about them. And I wonder how a message would intersect. And what's really interesting, I mean, I think law trains you in a way of thinking. I think it trains argumentation. But your writing, particularly in Bittersweet, is beautiful. Like it is almost a borders on poetry, I think, in places. Like it's prose. It's definitely that way. But I was thinking, you know, it almost feels like nonfiction that feels like fiction. It's not. It's a nonfiction book. But it has that lyrical, poetic, flow to it. So I'm just wondering if there's any traces of law left in your writing today or your speaking. You, you've spoken a lot about, you know, the terror of speaking as an introvert, but I'm wondering if there's any of that left um, in, in who you are today or how that law may have formed that. Um, I guess what I'd say is left is that, um, you know, when you go through that kind of high level training in anything, it it just trains you to really do everything right. And as a lawyer, you know, to ground your arguments in actual evidence. <laughs> so even though I'm, I start grounded in intuition and that's what makes me take on the subjects that I do, I, I, I try never to advance any argument or thesis without 
really like doing my research. And that's part of why my books take me so long. You know, I, I spend years at them and, and it's partly because I'm doing so much research, you know, and part of it is talking to people and reading books and part of it is combing through studies. Um, you know, I always have like an index this thick at the end of it. I'm sorry, not an index, end notes, you know, mm. at the end of, of my books because because I'm trained that way. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. So about a decade ago, I think it was, you really helped put introverts into the spotlight. You had a book called Quiet and a series of books following that. And your TED Talk, which uh, is one of the most downloaded TED Talks, watch TED Talks in, um, well, of all the TED Talks. But you make a really interesting argument that the 20, in the 20th century or the 20th century um, kind of made extrovert the normative, if you're going to be successful, you better be an extrovert personality. You look at the work of Dale Carnegie, et cetera, how to win friends and influence people. And you argue the same thing, like Tony Robbins tries to do the same thing. And so does Harvard Business School. They're, that Basically, the system is trying to turn everybody into an extrovert. What's the problem with that? And what do we lose, Susan, with that? Well, I mean, the problem, first of all, is that 50% of the population is introverted. So that's... 50% of humanity that is being sent the message that their natural way of being is somehow deficient, which mm. causes, you know, a whole lot of unnecessary psychic pain. Um, it also deprives the rest of us of all the talents and energies of those people, because when you're being sent the message that there's something wrong with the way you are, you what you end up doing is diverting a whole lot of energy that could have been better spent doing what you wanted to do. You're, you're instead diverting it into turning yourself into a pretzel to be somebody else. That's a problem. That's a problem. Did you feel that tension? Because I mean, what you're doing now, you kind of get to make up your own rules, right? As an artist, as a creative, as a, as an author. Uh, but did you feel that when you were working in the other system in law, that there was all this pressure to become something you were not? Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, I should have said that that's also another reason I'm so grateful for those years um, as a lawyer, like understanding how all this stuff plays out, you know, in the so-called real world. Um, so yeah, like I, I, I was always very interested, you know, at my law firm, I, I was always very interested in, like I, I served on every committee having to do with professional development and mentoring and, um, uh, and the women's working group and all these things. Like I was just very interested in how we as humans showed up to our work. Um, but what I thought was completely missing from that whole discussion, all those years I was a lawyer, was the question of how our temperaments informed um, how we would participate in meetings and in negotiations. You know, there was a lot of talk about well, women do this and men do this and so on. But there was never talk about, well, what do, what do introverts and extroverts do? I mean, that, that language in those days was just not on the table. There was no vocabulary for it. There wasn't even a way of thinking or processing it. Now it's become much more mainstream, but not back then. Um, and, and psychologists call introversion, extroversion, the North and South of human temperament. So to be leaving that out... <laughs> really didn't make sense. Um, and yeah, and, and what ended up happening was like, I started looking around and realizing that some of the lawyers who I most admired were extroverts and doing their job in kind of the classical sense of, you know, like kind of commanding the room and taking up a lot of space. Um, but some of them were equally, if not more effective by being very thoughtful and deliberate and cerebral and asking a lot of great questions in a negotiation and um, bringing people together, you know, a much more soft power type of approach, not as celebrated in our, in our culture, every bit as effective. So a decade ago, you started writing about uh, introversion and speaking about introversion and there was a long hiatus between um, quiet and bittersweet. What did you learn um, in that process? Like, what journey are you on? And uh, how have how have you changed, if at all? Maybe maybe you haven't. Between the two books. Yeah, between the two books. I don't know. You know, it, I spent. I, I guess um, 
in the years following quiet, the, the first few years, I, w- I was just like spending so much time speaking and yeah. working with people that I didn't have time for anything else. But then I, I started working on Bittersweet really not long after Quiet was published. It's just that I pour a lot of energy and, as I said, research into my book. So it takes me a long time to do them. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess it's worth, I guess it's worth saying what bittersweetness is and why I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, so hmm, bittersweetness, it's, I basically went on this quest for the last decade. <laughs> That's kind of what I've been doing. I've been on a quest um, <laughs> to, to grasp the power of a more bittersweet and even melancholic way of being, you know, just the way introversion was not something you could really talk about in our culture. The same is true of bittersweetness and melancholy. Um, You know, we're still living in a hyper positive culture where you shouldn't talk a bit about these things. But what I've learned is that the bittersweet tradition spans centuries. It spans continents and what these wisdom traditions and artistic traditions have been telling us for thousands of years is that this kind of existential longing that we all feel is the great gateway to belonging. And it's a gateway mm. to creativity. It's a gateway to communion. Um, bittersweetness, it's the, it's the recognition that light and dark and joy and sorrow are always and forever paired. Um, and But that what comes from that is a kind of curiously piercing joy at the beauty of the world. And so embracing this side of ourselves, it's one of the, the greatest and deepest powers that we have. Um, and we need to find a way to bring it back into our culture. It's been there in our wisdom traditions for centuries. We're just, we're just living in a kind of blip of time of a moment. Um, in which these things are considered unseemly to talk about. But, you know, we're talking about introversion now. We could talk about bittersweetness too. So, yeah, I do want to go there. And you talk pretty openly in your book. You say, uh, I think you define yourself as an agnostic, but a curious agnostic or a more open agnostic. And part of the book is actually deeply spiritual. You quote C.S. Lewis. You quote from different faith. Is it what do you love about from him? I mean, I love him. I love hmm. him. Tell me why. What do you what do you love about C.S. Lewis? Well, I mean, I guess first of all, I was first of all, his writing, of course, but hmm. also um the very thing that made me write this book is the same thing that C.S. Lewis was talking about all his life. You know, he talked about the inconsolable longing for we know not what. Um, and he he used the term sensucht, like the you know the great longing, and and he talked about how he would experience these moments of intense beauty. Like it, it, in his case, it first struck him uh, when his brother brought him like a little a little mini garden in a tin made out of moss and grass, and he was like so struck by the beauty of it that he was suddenly struck with this longing that he couldn't quite articulate um, what it was. And and in my case, I've had that experience, well, I've had it over and over and over again, especially in the form of music. Um, this, I'll come back to C.S. Lewis in a second, but the book actually started for me um, because all the way back when I was in law school, I was in my, I was hanging out in my dorm and some friends were coming to pick me up to class on the way to class. We were going to go to class together. And I was blasting from my stereo speakers, some minor key bittersweet music, which I often listen to. And yeah. my friends came and, and they were like, why are you listening to this funeral music? And I laughed at the time and we went to class and that's in some ways the end of the story, except I could not stop thinking about it, about what it was about this music that meant so much to me that I was blasting it for my speakers. And it's, there's something in, in minor key music, like if you think of Beethoven's Ode to Joy or something like that, you, um, it's like the, ex, the, the musician is expressing our longing for a more perfect and beautiful world. 
Mm-hmm. And, and they're expressing the sorrow that all humans know. And so you're feeling a kind of communion in that and they're transforming that sorrow into beauty. And that deep and, and existential longing, I believe, is at the heart of everything that C.S. Lewis talks about. Um, and in his case, you know, he, he ended up concluding, like I think he said, if we, uh, if we have a hunger that can't be satisfied, if we have a, a thirst that can't be quenched on this earth, it must be because we belong to another and more godly realm. Um, so that was his conclusion. I guess my conclusion is a little bit different, but I, but it doesn't, to me, to me, it's almost a distinction without a difference. Uh, at the heart of this existential longing, I believe, is it's it's a longing for home. It's a longing for you know a kind of ultimate love and whatever name we attach to it. For, for some people, it takes on an explicitly religious um, uh, explanation or a metaphorical one. Mm-hmm. It's all the same heart to me. Well, yeah, what would the distinction be for you as opposed to where C.S. Lewis landed? It's funny, I, I wonder if he's making a bit of a renaissance because Tim Ferriss recently, I don't know whether you know Tim at all, but... Uh, uh, I was just uh, just on his show. His show actually just released yesterday. Oh, it released yesterday. Well, I almost never miss an episode. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's rather intimidating. I've had a number of guests that Tim has interviewed and then I listen to his interviews and I'm like, oh, sharpen that pencil, Newhoff, sharpen that pencil. He's so good at what he does. You're a great interviewer. Well, thank you. Most of it I'm learning is listening. Yeah, absolutely. And as an extrovert, I almost have like a little piece of tape over top of my computer that says, just shut up, just shut up, let the guest talk, let the guest talk. Um, but he he actually referenced in today, actually, on, on his Five Bullet Friday, he referenced the C.S. Lewis movie, The Most Reluctant Convert, which is a biography of Lewis's life. So it's, it's a happy... Interesting. It is. I'm trying to remember if we talked about C.S. Lewis in our discussion, we may have. I can't remember now. Yeah, yeah. It all blurs into one, doesn't it? But but I'm sorry. But what were you going to ask me about C.S. Lewis? But so, well, I was going to ask you how your conclusion at this point varies from maybe where he landed. Because he's become one of the great Christian apologists. There's very few Christians. I mean, you look at Christianity, you've got all kinds of pockets here and there and denominations and left and right theologically and in the middle. I'm always in the middle. But... Um, you know, and different denominations, but almost everyone, Roman Catholic, Protestant, conservative, liberal, would say C.S. Lewis is something we can agree on. And I'm just wondering, so Christians hold him in high regard. I'm wondering, you know, where in your journey you are that would say, you know, it's, what did you say? It's a distinction without a difference or something? You're so good with words. Oh, I mean, for me, for me, it is. I And I hmm. to impose that on anyone else. Oh, you're not. Um, I'll just... Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I actually wrote about exactly the question that you're asking, like the difference between where C.S. Lewis ended up and where I am for this. Yeah, please. Um, so he, okay, I'm just going to read this passage from Lewis. I think this is one of the most beautiful passages that's ever been written. So his version is, um, he calls the longing, he, he says that what we do is we call the longing this inconsolable existential longing that we call it beauty and behave as if that had settled the matter. And for him, he says, but the books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us. If we trust to them, it was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. And he says, they are not the thing itself. They're only the scent of a flower. We have not found the echo of a tune. We have not heard. News from a country we have never yet visited. It's it's like it's so amazing. I got goosebumps. I really do. Yeah. 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 So that that that's Lewis's um mm. conclusion. And what I feel is that um yeah, to me the, the, this whole bittersweet tradition that I've been exploring um for this last decade really. To me, it extinguishes these these differences between atheists and believers. It's 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 it feels to me almost like a false dichotomy that we mm. have in our culture. Um, because the longing 
like the, the longing, it comes through Yahweh, it comes through Allah, it comes through Christ, it, it, it comes through the books, it comes through the music. To me, the, these are all equally the divine. Uh, whatever name we give for it, we all know that experience. It's like um, that moment when you gaze upon something intensely beautiful, you know, and maybe it's a painting or maybe yeah. it's a, a, a child splashing in a rain puddle. That moment when you have tears in your eyes, um, at at the sheer beauty of something, we've all had those experiences, and I often wonder, like, what is it that makes us cry when we're looking at that much beauty? Um, hmm. And the answer, and I actually use this as a the epigraph to the book. I believe the answer is that at those moments we are apprehending the gap between that more perfect world of home that we long to be in, the more perfect and beautiful world, and the world that we're in right now. Um, Mm. But there's something sacred in that gap because it makes us reach towards that world. And like that's the impulse that drives our creativity and our desire for a more perfect love because we're like, we're apprehending it at that moment. And, um, and (laughs) that was like the great, perception that I've been immersed in for the last decade. And just as the book, my book, Bittersweet, was about to go to press, I found this incredible quote about Gregory the Great um, from the year 540, who talked about what he called compunctio, which he said was the holy pain. And he says, this is the grief somebody feels when faced with that which is most beautiful. Um, And that the bittersweet experience stems from human, human homelessness in an imperfect world. That inner spiritual void becomes most painfully real when faced with beauty. Susan, I think so many of us can relate to that. So I took your test. I want to look at my notes here. And you have that little test in the prelude or the introduction to the book where, can you walk us through sort of the three, I think it's three different personality types that you, you, it's not a personality type, but um, can you walk us through that? And then in my notes, I'm going to find where I was. Oh, there it is. I scored a 7.4. I shocked myself. So I think I'm one of you. <laughs> okay. I'm going to talk about the quiz and then I want to ask you why it was shocking, why your answer was okay. shocking to you. Okay. So the quiz, Great. this was a, a quiz that I developed together with the psychologists, uh, Scott Barry Kaufman and David Yaden, who are these incredible psychologists who are deep into examining all these kinds of questions that you and I are talking about. Uh-huh. And um, and the quiz, what it does is it measures your measures a person's tendency to experience these states of existential longing and mm-hmm. bitter sweetness. Um, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll give your listeners who don't have the quiz in front of them. Though I should say it's in the book, and I think we're also going to put it online in a day or two. No, that's great. We'll link to it if it shows up online. And, and the book is, 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 it's a reread for me. I mean, you read it to prepare for an interview, but I'm like, this is going to the beach with me this summer. Oh my gosh. I wouldn't have called it beach reading, but I love it. I mean, okay. it's, my, it's my style of beach reading. The cabin. Heavy it, books, it, it, <laughs> maybe my personality. That's why I read books like that at the beach. I, I definitely don't read trashy novels at the beach. So <laughs> yeah, I'm totally with you. Okay. So a few questions you could ask yourself. Um, like, do you react intensely to music, art, or nature? Yes. Do you find comfort or inspiration in a rainy day? Um, Sometimes, although I like sunshine. I mean, yeah, sunshine. <laughs> are we playing along or are you just reading sample questions? I'm just reading sample questions. Okay, answer, I'll be quiet. Answer too, oh, you, you want me to answer? Um, okay. Uh, and um, here's another one. Have others described you as an, a, quote, old soul? No, that one I, I said... Maybe when I was younger a little bit, but not, I guess I am an old soul, but no, I scored low on that one. Okay. Oh, keep going. Here's, here's C.S. Lewis again. You see, I really love him. Do you know what the author C.S. Lewis meant when he described joy as a quote, sharp, wonderful stab of longing? Yes. Yes. 10 out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you moved to goosebumps several times a day? Um, some days, depending on my state of mind, but yeah, I can be like today you move me to goosebumps reading that quote, <laughs> literally. Well, so, so there's a bunch more questions, but I'll just say, um, yeah, basically the, the more you tend to answer yes to these kinds of questions, the more you probably experience these kinds of states of bittersweetness. 
And what we found is that people who, te- who score high on this quiz also tend to be predisposed to states of awe, wonder, self-transcendence, mm-hmm. um, and, to cre- and, and to absorption, which predicts creativity. So that was very interesting. Yeah, and and I was significantly above the benchmark for the bittersweet personality type, which surprised me because as you know, your sample questions, I didn't answer eight, nine, ten out of ten. I didn't think I answered ten out of ten on anything. I think that's for another life. But I answered a lot of nines and a few fives and fours. And I think you picked the ones I was lower on. But what got me thinking about it, it was funny. You mentioned the music in your college dorm. So prior to law, my pre-law was history and political science, but I almost had a third minor in philosophy. Loved it. And I would not play um, my minor symphonies. I would play the Smiths. If you remember the Smiths, how soon is now that sort of alt rock British band that my wife just calls the most depressing music she's ever heard in her life. And uh, I had to stop to to stay married listening to the Smiths in, in communal time. But I was also really drawn, like I thought if I wasn't a Christian, I would probably be an existentialist bordering on nihilism. Like that that kind of Nietzsche, despair, cynic, um, deconstructionism. A- apart from my faith, that's where I end up, which I found quite dark. And so it's my faith, actually, that infused the bitter sweetness. There's a sweetness there as well as seeing the bitter. And I've, I've, I want to write a book about this sometime, but I think, you know, one of my, my, my takeaways from that personality type is you see life for what it really is and it's tragedy and it's brutality and you're not being toxically positive about, oh, just look up, Susan, everything's going to be wonderful and the sun will shine and here are my simple answers, which I think as preachers, we are guilty of a lot. And so you see life for what it really is, and it's pretty bleak. But rather than going to despair, you, beautiful. it's okay, there you go. It's also beautiful. But you keep your heart fully engaged. You don't get cynical. So I don't know, that's, that's my take. You asked me, you know, where do you land on the test? So that's how I read it. Comments, thoughts, reflections? Yeah, I mean, I have so many, so many thoughts about that because I, I know exactly what you mean. And I do think that um, if you're someone who is, who's looking at life, I would say without the rose colored glasses and also without the dark glasses, you're just looking at it, I, I believe as it is, you know, with joy and sorrow, both and, and life contains both those things. It's, it's equally broken. It's equally beautiful. Um, if you're looking at that, you, you could take that in two different directions. And one would be in the direction of nihilism, as you say. Mm. I believe it can also take us in a completely different direction. And that's, that's what I'm writing about. Um, there's something about the fact that we are all in this state together, um, this state of beauty and brokenness, um, this state of existential exile, the state in which the Garden of Eden is always over there. And, mm. to, and we get to experience momentary glimpses of it that transform everything, but we don't actually ever inhabit it. There's something about the fact that we're all in that state together that can bring us to the deepest communion possible. So far from it alienating us from each other and from higher values, it can do exactly the opposite. Um, and that's what I feel when I listen to that music. I feel uh, like it's the closest I, I get on this earth, I think, to true, self-trans- true self-transcendent experiences, you know, <clears throat> feeling connected to the all. And, um, and, and you can even get there through an evolutionary argument, too. Because, and, and I look at this in chapter one, where I look at the work of the great Berkeley psychologist, Dacher Keltner, who has investigated what he calls the compassionate instinct. And what he's found is that our, our ability to have true compassion for each other and for other beings, it stems from the fact that we are mammals who survive only by reacting viscerally to the cries of our infants. Um, but, but our ability to react like that is not actually limited only to our own infants. It extends to other people's infants and it extends to other beings in distress. And, 
it's not that we're perfect with this because God knows we have way too much cruelty and violence. So I, like, I'm not trying to give a Pollyanna vision of humanity, um, but we do have that capability. And, he, and he's actually shown this in study after study. So one of them, he looked at the vagus nerve, which is the biggest, um, it's, 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 it's like a bundle of nerves in, in our body. It's the biggest one. It's responsible for our most fundamental drives, like breathing, digestion, sex, all from the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve also reacts when we see another being in distress. You know, he's actually shown this. Your, your vagus nerve is activating. It's like responding viscerally to someone else's sorrow. So this most fundamental and ancient bodily function that helps us breathe also helps us feel compassionate. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah. Keep going. Okay. So, so yeah. So uh, Darwin, Darwin saw this too. Like, you know, you could look at evolution, you could look at Darwin and, and wring your hands in despair from the pop culture version of it, because the pop culture version is it's all survival of the fittest. You know, it's a bleak, love the jungle. Um, it, it's just a competition. There's no heart in it. But what Keltner points out is that you can also, also read Darwin as saying the lesson is survival of the kindest um, because of these instincts that, that we have. And again, I don't mean to be Pollyanna. Darwin himself was an incredibly melancholic, gentle soul <laughs> who, like his father wanted him to be a doctor, but he was so horrified at the sight of blood that he couldn't stand it. And so he was like, he was very, very upset at seeing the brutality that existed among humans and among animals. So he was very aware of, of all of that. But he also noted that what he called, I, I forget what his words in, in his book, The Descent of Man, but he basically said the sympathetic instinct that humans and animals have is the strongest one of all of our instincts because it, it happens on a kind of pre-conscious level um, that, you know, you, you see suffering and you're responding in some kind of visceral way. So these two things, these two attributes of humanity, the, the capability for cruelty and the capability for sympathy, they exist side by side too, just the way joy and sorrow do. And, um, and I find it very helpful to just be aware of both sides because then you have the, the will, the knowledge, and the ability to turn in one direction or the other, even as you're not denying reality. It's interesting because I think there's, there's a lot of talk in psychology circles about toxic positivity, right? Whether that's in the workplace, you have to be positive all the time, no negative emotions allowed. And I, I know a lot of leaders who are like, don't give me bad news, right? It's like, well, there's just news. I don't know what we do with it. <laughs> you know, reality is your friend. But if you look at the, like even the biblical tradition, the Christian and Hebrew scriptures, right? You know, from the Psalms are as much lament as joy. I mean, and there are some that are just pure lament. What, what, what is the danger of a superficially positive culture or a toxically positive culture. And I'm, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of all the preachers who are listening to this, because we have a disproportionate number of that in our audience, who feel that they have to be up all the time and that their job is to rally people with, you know, happiness or make them happy. I just, I think your book just does such a beautiful and piercing job of um, challenging that in the most poetic way. Oh, thank you. The, the danger is that you're not speaking truly to people's hearts. Um, that kind of message of upbeatness and positivity, it can work for so long. It can work for, for some amount of time, but it's not going to work forever because at the end of the day, it's not responding to the truth and people want the truth and they want to be inspired within the world as it is and not the world as we might wish it to be, but also to be shown that the world as it is contains this insane amount of beauty um, that you actually can see, you can see it all the more clearly for, for also 
seeing its brokenness. Um, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, kind of a a lesson from psychology in this. And I, I talk about this in the book too. The the, the Stanford psychologist Laura Karstensen, um, she she looks at older people, and she has found that older people tend to be happier. Um, <laughs> they they tend to have more gratitude, um, feel a greater sense of meaning. Uh, they're less sort of irritated by the everyday issues of life. And you might say, and, and, and there is this kind of folk wisdom, right, of, um, of there being a wisdom that comes with old age. But what she found is that older people have these attributes, not because of some magical wisdom that they've acquired, but rather because they are aware of life's fragility. And it's the awareness of the fragility that gives them all of these other attributes that bring peace and a quieter kind of joy. And she knows this because she's done all these studies and she's found that younger people who, because of who, for various forms of life experience, have also been primed to feel fragility. Um, so she's looked at younger people who are living in situations of political danger or like um, the SARS outbreak and in. in uh, in the Far East, a couple of decades ago, she looked at um, younger people who feel life's fragility also have those same attributes of wisdom and joy. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, so, one of the challenges, and and I hope this question makes sense, but a lot of the leaders I talk to, and I think every leader has been through exceedingly crushing last two years, right? The pandemic global disruption. And a lot of leaders, not every leader, but a lot of leaders are, are dealing with loss at a level that they have never dealt with loss before. And we're used to, as leaders, being in the cause and effect world. In other words, well, I'll just turn this dial up and everything will be fixed. And it's not fixed. The, you know, For people who lead churches, they're anywhere from 50 to 30% smaller than they were two years ago. And it doesn't look like that's turning around anytime soon. A lot of business leaders went bankrupt or are dealing with a fundamentally disrupted market. And, you know, obviously there were some winners over the last couple of years as well. I'm not painting it all bleak, but I wonder if your book is a, provides a framework, or I'd like to ask you, how does it provide a framework to see things differently and realize that perhaps not all is as lost as you think it is? Or is there a way to get through the pain? Because so many leaders say, I think this is under the question, the way I will get through this pain is things will be the way they were or better. And I think there's a falseness in that argument. And I'd love for you to, to tackle that. Yeah. I mean, things won't be the way they were or better because things are never the same. And yeah. um, embracing life's fragility also means embracing the fact that nothing ever stays the same. And life is just an ongoing series of transitions. That's what it is. Mm. And, um, you know, and some of them are going to seem like joyful changes and some will seem like neutral and some will seem like, well, it's really a bummer that things have shrunk since where they were before. Uh, like that, that's just how it is. Um, so I think understanding that is the first step towards adapting to it because then you have less resistance to the change because you're expecting it. You're expecting it. Um, and I do think, especially now, given everything that we're all going through in the world, um, to meet people where they are um, and tell them the truth, tell them the truth about what it's like to be alive and where to find the joy and where to find the beauty in a broken world. And, and to admit that that's what this world is. But that, I mean, why do people come to religion in the first place? They come to religion because they know this. They know this. They know this instinctively. And this is what religions have always been telling us. Your good friend, Adam Grant, I uh, emailed him and asked him for any suggested questions. And he came through with some really fun ones. Uh, but I think this is a nice segue into a story. I'm just looking for this in my notes. Adam asked, he said, in what world, this is a direct quote <laughs> when he emailed me, he said, ask Susan this. In what world 
is Min Kim not the rightful legal owner of her s- stolen Strad, her guitar, her Stradivarius? Uh, that section left me so morally outraged that I started wondering if I should go to law school to fight it. So it's a beautiful story, though, and a really surprising ending. And I'm wondering if you would tell that story. Um, she is the same person, if I'm correct, who was at your latest TED Talk, too, if people want to meet her and her work. But do you mind telling that story? Because I think it's a beautiful parable of loss and perhaps redemption. I don't even know that you'd call it that. But uh, And then maybe we'll see Adam come out of law school as a, a crusader. We'll see. <laughs> Um, yes. Okay. So Min Kim, she's a dear friend of mine. Min was one of this world's great, uh, musical prodigies for her and the violin. Um, you know, from the age of seven or eight, she was a heralded prodigy. And one of the great things that happened to her as a prodigy is that somehow she, when she was only 16 or 17, was presented with the ability to acquire a Stradivarius violin which, you know, if, if you know anything about that world, it's hard to even put into words the symbolic meaning of a Stradivarius violin. It's like, uh, it's like an instrument from the heavens. You know, yeah. Stradivarius was, um, was, he was a violin maker from two or three centuries ago, and his violins are considered to be the greatest ones of all time. People have tried to reproduce whatever it is that he did, to make these instruments that were that are capable of producing this much beauty and no one has been able to figure out how. So Min was one of the lucky people who was able to acquire one of these. And her love for that violin, she wrote a whole memoir about it. It's hard, hard to put into words, but that that violin to her was her lover, her twin, her child, herself. It was everything. To the point where she she lived in like a tiny little apartment because all of her income was devoted to the upkeep of this violin and the perfection of it. Because there's all different things apparently you have to do to make a violin really sing. Um, so she loved this violin. It was never out of her sight until the day came when it was stolen from her. And so for her, this is the most profound loss imaginable. Was she in a cafe or something? She took her eyes off for 30 seconds and it disappeared. It was, it's like one of those things. Yeah, it's yeah. a long story. She was at a, um, a a tube station. She lives in London. Oh. So she was at a tube station um, and at a Pret um, a Manger restaurant and took the, her eyes off the violin for a split second and it was whisked away. Um, <laughs> and she fell into the darkest of depressions, which... Again, if you're not from this world, you'd say, how could you do that from the loss of an object? But remember, for her, this was her lover and her child and self all wrapped into one. And she stopped performing. She had been on the verge of making her worldwide debut as an adult performer. And all of that came to a crashing halt. Yeah. And she she fell into a depression that lasted for some years. Um. Until, as I say, transitions, you know, um, she started to emerge from it little by little by little. Um, And she acquired another violin and she decided that she was going to transform the pain that she had endured into other forms of creativity. And she realized she was never going to be a virtuoso again because she couldn't do it without that violin. But she's still a deeply creative person. So the first thing that she did was she wrote a memoir about her experiences. The memoir is called Gone. And I was actually, this is how I met Min. We just happened to have the same editor. And my editor sent it to me and said, I think you might like this. It was like a few months before it published. And it arrived in my email inbox as a Microsoft Word document, you know, so with no fanfare. And I, I started reading this book and I just stayed up all night. It was so mesmerizing and so lyrical in the way that music can be, except this was on the page. Um, and so she has transformed um, her sorrow and put it 
into other places. And, you know, now she's doing all these other musical projects. And the thing is, when I first met Min, I had this fantasy. I had this fantasy that the readers of the world would read her book and they would all unite to buy back Min's violin. Because the part I left out of the story is that through the vagaries of the way musical insurance works, um, the authorities actually f- were able to get Min's violin back some years later from the thieves who had stolen it. But she had already spent her insurance money on a different violin, so she no longer owns her her violin. It's gone, and it, it's actually in the home, I believe, of an oligarch, and it's just sitting there silent. Yeah, so the thieves sold it to an oligarch who's not using it and it's just sitting there and now it's worth millions or something? Yeah, I I, I don't even understand the technicalities of how it came to be. I guess neither, as Adam said, neither does he. It's hard to understand why it is that someone else was able to buy it back and not her. Um, why it wasn't just restored to her. But now the only way she would be able to get it back is to pay. Uh, the, the, the price of violins has gone way up over the years. So now it would be to pay millions upon millions of dollars, which she doesn't have. So I had this fantasy that we could all unite to buy back the violin from, from this oligarch. Um, and she said the most extraordinary thing. She said, no, I don't think I should have the violin back now. Um, because that violin has, since then it's had its own experiences and I've had mine and now we're moving in these different paths and I'll still always love it. Just the way I, her, she doesn't say it, she says her, I'll still always love her the way I always did. Um, but, but now we're in these separate pathways. So, you know, that idea that we were talking about before of really understanding that life is a series of changes that come, it's like rolling changes and some are devastating and some are joyful and some are more neutral. Um, But we kind of move through them all. And that's what you can see men doing. I found that a really profound story and thank you for telling it because you would think, right, that, okay, we're all going to band together. Everybody give what they can, get her $3 million. She gets her strad back. Everybody lives happily ever after. And she's like, I'm a different person and I don't know that I want it back, which is, which is really interesting. That almost goes back to where we started with, you know, if I had to do it over again, would I skip law? But it made you who you are today, right? Like there's, yeah, yeah. There, there's a certain piece to that on a, on a different level. And I think for all the sorrow we've been through, all the difficulty, you know, for me, if I believe in a sovereign God, then perhaps I don't want to undo it. Perhaps I don't want to get rid of the pain or the heartbreak or or the things that have happened in my life that made me who I am. I may work hard to avoid it in the future, but, you know, uh, it's it's so good. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know what I think about that myself. I, I, I yeah, tell me. question a lot because, I mean, the truth is, if I had a magic wand and, you know, could wave away all sorrow and grief and heartbreak and all these things, would I do it? Um, probably, like, honestly, yeah. I probably would, sure. I guess. Um, so, so I don't, I I guess I would want to stop personally. I would want to stop short of saying, um, you know, sorrow equals good. It's not, I I don't mean it Mm. in that sense. I think it's much more like, this is the world we have. Um, so we come into this world that has joy and sorrow and we come into this world, um, filled with an existential longing from the very first moment that we don't really understand. And in this world that we have, we can recognize that these experiences that might at first seem like afflictions can also be gateways to, to the things we value most, you know, love and creativity and communion. That's my best answer. There's something very beautiful about that. So uh, from a totally different direction, um, you and Adam Grant and Malcolm Gladwell and Daniel Pink form the Next Big Idea Club. I would love to know, uh, first of all, and thank you for including one of my books in that last fall that was uh, so, so, so honoring, shocking, surprising, whole deal. What do you, those are pretty stunning colleagues. 
if I may so say so. And they have a very stunning colleague in you. What are you learning from people like Adam and Daniel and Malcolm in your journey as a writer and a human? Um, I think that one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest side gifts, actually, of having books that do well the way I've been so lucky to have is that you get to meet people like Adam and Dan and Malcolm, you know, Mm. um, and, and like you and like many others in that world, that that's an amazing gift. Um, And I guess I'd I'd say it's really fascinating to see each person's creative process up close and to understand how different they all are from each other and how much each person's way of being creative and thoughtful flows so directly from who they are as humans and therefore they're all incredibly singular Um, and you can't really you can't do it their way what you can learn from them really is that you can't do it their way you can only do it your way because their way is so unique like once you know them you're like oh yeah that's so adam that's so dan like of course he would write it like that um and and so i think for people who want to be creative or share their ideas the lesson is that you really have to go to you um, so that someone is going to say, you know, that's so, that's so Carrie or that's so whoever the person is um, who's wishing right now for that. That is such a beautiful and hard fought lesson in my life as, you know, a content creator to realize that there is a disappointment and a joy in realizing, oh, this is me. Right. And then you lean into that creativity. We will link to uh, interviews with Daniel Pink, Dan Pink, and Adam Grant in the show notes. And also, I think I'm interviewing Dan again soon for his new book. So. Oh, awesome. And delighted delighted to have you on. One day, perhaps, Malcolm. I would love that opportunity. He, uh, he is a, a fellow Canadian, so there you go. <laughs> expat, expat. Susan, this has been a delight. Thank you. You've been so generous with your time, with your insight, with your wisdom. The book is called Bittersweet. It is available everywhere. And if people want to connect with you, first of all, tell us about your TED Talk, the new one, and then where they can find you online. Yeah, sure. Um, So the new TED Talk is called The Hidden Power of Sad Songs and Rainy Days. And Mm. it it talks about, it's really a a talk about existential longing. Um, That's what it's about. And and as you said earlier, uh, Min is up there on stage with me playing on her violin, the Albanoni in G minor, um, which is really beautiful. So you can find that at TED, TED.com. And um, and then where else to find me? I mean, my book is coming out April 5th and it's mm-hmm. available everywhere. The books are sold. And my website is susancane.net and you can get the book there as well as sign up for my newsletter. Um, and I'm also on all the social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, I would love to connect with all of you. Susan, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Again, this has been a delightful conversation. I feel should have been a three hour meal, but uh, we had a, a, a one hour feast. Yes, one day. We will do that. And perhaps we'll have a round two. So, so grateful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. Grateful to be here. Thank you for watching the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope it's helped you thrive in life and leadership. And if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, inside you'll find everything you need to lead, grow, and run a church. And now, a word from our sponsor, Belay. If you've ever struggled with bookkeeping, watch this video because not only is it going to increase your peace of mind, but you're going to wonder why you waited so long. (laughs) Then it's tax season. I still need all of your vendors W-9 forms from last year. Here. (laughs) That's nice, sweetheart, but I'm not thirsty. A belay bookkeeper? Really? Is that where we are now? I took care of the forms for Dan this morning. They are already in your inbox. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, let's let them enjoy their day. Never miss a moment. Leave the tea. Modern staffing from belay. Great, please. You know there's not even any real tea in there? Bubba, she's a young girl. Let her have fun. Have fun today, sweetie. Get out, Bubba.
Oh, you are being ridiculous. 